Shadow Home Affairs Minister Christina Keneally now. And to take us there, here was the Prime Minister making a case for the Religious Discrimination Act. We seek to put in place the opportunity for those who wish to live their religion here in this country and live their faith, which has such an important contribution to our country and always has, binding Australia together, not forcing it apart. Uh, this is why I made that pledge before the last election and that is why I continue to stand very strongly on this point. Christina Keneally, welcome to the program. Great to be here and David, unlike Barnaby Joyce, I keep my commitments and turn up for my interviews. OK, good. Uh, let's go straight to the most contentious part of this religious discrimination debate this week. Uh, religious schools and transgender students. If you win the election, will Labor remove the ability of religious schools to discriminate, um, to turn away gay and transgender kids? Well, David, let's look at what Labor did in the Parliament this week. Uh, we do believe that people of faith dis deserve discrimination, uh, protection from discrimination and extending the law to do that. And we think that should not come at the expense of increasing discrimination to other groups of people. We also uh, believe that students at school should be protected. And that reflected in the amendments that we moved and supported. And so we would like to see the government now accept that amendment that has been supported by the House of Representatives with those five Liberals crossing the floor. And they should just get this bill done. The Prime Minister promised some years ago to people of faith he would provide this legislative protection. He promised in writing that he would protect children. If he's going to break that promise, he deserves to. Exp he needs to explain it to the Australian people. What about teachers? Should religious schools be able to hire and fire teachers based on whether they're gay or transgender? Well, Labor also supports the right of uh, religious schools, faith-based schools, uh, to be able to hire staff, whether it's teachers or other staff, that support the, the mission and the values of the school. I'm a former Catholic school teacher myself. Uh, my children and I are all educated in the Catholic school system, and I well understand. It's the basketball coach that leads the prayers before you go out on the court. It's the, it's the staff in the front office and how they deal with students. Uh, but this is a more complex issue, and so we do support it going to the Australian Law Reform Commission. Why do you need to further review whether schools should be able to sack a teacher for being gay? Well, in fact, I would argue that most religious schools don't want to sack a teacher for being gay. In my experience uh, with the Catholic school system intimately and as a former Premier, my experience with faith-based schools across uh, a wide range of faiths, that's not what they seek to do. Mm. Uh, I think what's important here is that schools are able to have staff who uphold the mission and the values of the school. They're mission-based organisations. They're there to educate and, and support children's development within a faith. Uh, but there are some intersections and there are some uh, complexities. And so we've, uh, we agree that the Australian Law Reform Commission should look but, at it. But, I mean, you know, as critics have pointed out, you wouldn't need to review whether a school should have the power to sack someone based on their race. Mm. Their, 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 their gender or sexual identity um, shouldn't that be treated in a similar way? Well, I would point you to, in fact, uh, the private senator's bill that S uh, Penny Wong moved prior to the last election where we sought to provide the parliament uh, with a, a, an approach on this issue and, and the government walked away from that. Uh, and really, it's a recognition that in the roles that teachers and other staff perform at the school, they, they should be, a, the school should be able to require them to uphold the mission and the values. I think when you come to some of these other issues of how does that interact or how, how can that be prescribed, those are some legitimate questions to be asked of the Australian Law Reform Commission. But it just seems a pretty fundamental principle, doesn't it? I mean, should you be sacked for being gay? I don't think you should. I don't think you should. Well, why can't but you say you'll, you'll, you'll change the law to ensure that's the case. And in fact, we have said we do believe that people should, we should have protection for people of faith, but that should not come in at the cost of increasing discrimination to other groups of people. And I do think that teachers are in a slight, and, and other staff are in a slightly different uh, category than children. And so it's straightforward with children. We think there are some slight complexities with teachers and staff that should be looked at by the Law Reform Commission. You, Labor also voted for the Religious Discrimination Bill in the House, and that includes the Statement of Belief Clause, which would protect religious statements even if they offend or insult. 
Why did Labor vote for that? Well, in fact, we made clear going into that debate we were going to move those amendments both in the House and the Senate, and we anticipate and would move them in the Senate should the government bring the bill on for a debate. Well, that's not going to happen now. So going to the election, well, what, will still, your, what will your policy... Still. Well, OK, what will your policy position be? What would you do in government should you win? Why do we need... Uh, a religious discrimination act, what should people of faith be able to say that they can't currently say? Well, David, I think it's more about that people of faith should not be discriminated against for being people of faith. In, in, in southwestern Sydney, where I live, I've had Sikh men and Muslim women tell me about their experiences of seeking employment as visibly identifiable people of faith. They've also told me about their experiences of being um, harassed or worse when they move about in the community. Now, overwhelmingly, we are a harmonious um, community, uh, but these things do happen to people, and that's why we move the anti-vilification amendment as well. But I'm asking you about the statement of belief mm. element here. Would you have any sort of statement of belief clause that allows people of faith to say things that they currently can't? What we, uh, what we did was seek to amend the bill. What would you fact, do, though? As I've said, David, if you allow me to finish, um, what we have done in the parliament is support the bill, which 90% of it is supportable in its current form. There are issues where we have moved amendments around the statement of belief uh, to, to clarify that, around anti-vilification and around protecting all children. Those amendments represent the policy and the values that we would seek to enact in legislation if Scott Morrison does not keep to his promise in legislate it in this term of parliament. But just for the viewers, what does that mean? What do you want to allow people of faith to say? It's not about what people of faith can say. It's about how people of faith are protected from discrimination. No, 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 sorry, the, the statement of belief is all about what you can state. Well, in fact, because Labor moved an amendment to clarify the statement of belief and, in fact, to make the point that the statement of belief clause in this legislation does not really work. It doesn't work with state and territory law. It would seek to override so state... So you, would, you wouldn't have it? We have made clear that we would uh, clarify the statement of belief. To what? If you would please let me finish my Please. sentence, thank you. What we, what we, what our concerns about statement of belief uh, came down to the fact that it would, in fact, quite likely make it harder for people of faith uh, and other people to achieve protection from discrimination because of the way that it interacts with state and territory law. I'm still unclear as to what your statement of belief would do. Well, I'm not sure that we necessarily would need a statement of belief. OK, so you wouldn't have one. But we, the amendment that we moved made clear is that the statement of belief clause in this legislation was too problematic right. and did not achieve the aim of protecting discrimination. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have one? David, we're not going to govern from opposition. The Prime Minister put forward this legislation. I'm just asking where you we stand. We to, and I'm being clear with you, and I think, our, I think the amendments that we've moved in the House of Representatives right. and will move in the Senate, if the government ever keeps to its commitment to bring this legislation on, uh, demonstrate the commitments that we have uh, around religious discrimination and protecting all people. Let's move on uh, to national security. Um, Defence Minister Peter Dutton says China wants Labor to win the election. Labor's outraged by this uh, claim that he's made. Has that comment, has that suggestion damaged Australia's national security, do you think? Well, first, let's be, uh, understand something here. This is a desperate government, so desperate to distract from its own incompetence, that it is now weaponizing national security. Weaponizing national security in the lead up to an election and weaponizing it in the context of a liberal leadership uh, contest. This, uh, this weaponization of national security, it is divisive and dangerous. It flies in the face of the advice of the ASIO Director General Mike Burgess when he said using fear of foreign interference to stoke division in the community is as corrosive as foreign interference itself. So this is a divisive and dangerous tactic by Peter Dutton. And we really do need to understand that it undermines our national security agencies and it undermines our national security um, framework. David, I'm on the Intelligence and Security Committee in the Parliament. It represents the best of our bipartisan approach to national security in, its na in the national interest. And I pay tribute to my Liberal colleagues on that committee. But Mr. Dutton and Mr. Morrison, with their politicization of national security, are representing the worst of partisan politics. And neither man is demonstrating the judgment 
nor the character that Australians rightly expect from their Prime Minister. You'll have uh, Mike Burgess, the head of ASIO, before Senate estimates uh, this week. He, wa he wasn't going into specifics at all when he raised um, mm. the, the, the... Well, he aired, uh, he revealed uh, that there had been an attempt at foreign interference. Does it help, though, do you think, making those sort of things public at all? Mm. Well, first of all, I do commend the ASIO Director General, uh, Mike Burgess, for his, uh, his determination uh, to be up front with the Australian people about the threats that we face. Foreign interference is a real and growing problem. As Mike Burgess said, it is affecting all political parties. Indeed, it's affecting businesses and civil society. Uh, and it is, it is a threat that we need to take seriously. And, I, and the Morrison government has failed to do that. It has failed to provide support to MPs and, and members okay, of parliament. OK, but I'm, I'm just asking about yeah. whether it helps or not. I mean, there is an argument that you, you mm. do need to uh, you know, talk about what is happening in a general term. Do you agree? I do think we do. We need to bring the, the public along with us. Uh, but it is also uh, irresponsible for the uh, mm. Liberal Party, for the government of the day, this Liberal government, to be weaponising that information in, uh, in the lead up to a federal election. A couple of other things. The protests, big numbers uh, yesterday, those anti-vaccine mandate protests in Canberra that have been uh, building for, for days. Uh, Barnaby Joyce has defended their right to protest. What do you think? Yeah, I was in uh, the Parliament House yesterday as that protest was occurring and the Parliament was effectively shut down. I have not seen a uh, security presence uh, like the one I saw yesterday. Uh, it was extraordinary. Uh, and quite clearly our national security agencies were worried about groups and individuals at that protest who have the propensity for violence. Uh, and let's understand something here. This protest shut down a suicide prevention charity event. Such was its risk to public safety. It shut down the Lifeline book fair. Now, you know, yesterday we saw the Prime Minister saying he understood, and really, your problem is with the states, not with me. You know, this is a Prime Minister who set up the National Cabinet, who stood there and took credit for when the Premiers took measures. As soon as a, a group of protesters rocks into town critical of some of those decisions, he points the fingers at the Premiers, says it's not my fault, it's theirs. Why? He wants to harvest the second preferences of these protesters. Well, as far I mean, as the protest goes, though... He should stand up and condemn the violent extremists who were part of that protest, and he should make clear that has no place in Australian democracy. So if there are violent extremists in this protest, not all of them clearly are no. violent extremists, what should happen? The Prime Minister should make clear that that has no place in Australian democracy. Let's understand what some of these violent extremists want to do. They want to undermine our democratic processes. They, they are seeking to exploit the fear and the frustration in the pandemic for their own far-right extremist ends. And the Prime Minister not only needs to make clear that that's not appropriate, he needs to tell his senators, like Jared Rennick and Alex Antic and George Christensen, not to be going out and giving comfort uh, and, and a, a wink and a nod uh, to some of these extremist views. Finally, on the New South Wales by-elections last night, four seats uh, up for grabs. Labor won the seat of Bega. What do the results mean, do you think, for the federal election and Labor's prospects in that part of the world? Well, first of all, a big congratulations to Labor leader Chris Minns and to my friend J Jason Yatsen Lee and Dr Michael Holland, uh, particularly for that historic win in Bega, a safe Liberal seat now in Labor hands. You know, this is the first election we have seen uh, in the pandemic where there have been swings against the incumbent. Uh, and it's quite clear that uh, the voters in New South Wales in these by-elections sent a clear message to Dominic Perrottet. Uh, they reject his handling of the Omicron uh, pan uh, outbreak. But I think federally there are a few implications and let me let me go through them quickly. Uh, one in Bega, uh, the biggest swings against the Liberals were in areas that were most affected by the bushfires. And we see that there, there are voters who remember a Prime Minister who went to Hawaii while their homes were burning down and that he doesn't hold a hose. Uh, in Strathfield, the biggest swings against the Liberals were in seats, in areas in that seat, uh, where there are a high proportion of Australians of Chinese background. And uh, it shows a rejection, a repudiation of Peter Dutton's uh, divisive tactics.
uh, in the parliament this week. Shows it's dangerous territory, not just for our national security, but dangerous territory well, for the Liberals electorate. Labor's vote actually went backwards a little bit in, uh, in, in Strathfield, to be, to be clear. But just, just finally. Well, I, I, on that point, since you've raised it, um, I'd observe that uh, the only other parties running in that election were uh, centre-left parties, uh, and and in yeah, some well. of them didn't preference. And also there were uh, ballots that were sent out uh, to every voter uh, only in English. So we don't, we, 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 in this context where we had a, a popular local member retiring, I'm not surprised by the result in Strathfield. It's a clear retain for Labor. And I got to say, you know, Dominic Perrottet last night showed he had, wasn't listening to the message that voters well, sent him. He I, should I, probably I, look at the result in the seat of Willoughby. 18% swing against the Liberal Party. As a former Premier, though, of New South Wales, do you have any sympathy for Dominic Perrottet? The Penrith by-election on your mm. watch was a record swing at the time. Mm. Against, at the uh, time, no, no longer. Uh, look, uh, you make a good point. There's probably some similarities between Dominic Perrottet and me. We both took over as Premier at the end of long-term governments. Um, you know, and we... Well, we're both Catholic, we both like basketball, we're both tall. That might be where the similarities end. Uh, although, you know, I wouldn't mind so much if uh, we added another one and he lost at the election. Maybe we'll see him in the Senate down the track. Mm. Christina Canelli, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.